I'm here at Colt Creek State Park where we're going to take a hike through the woods and learn about things like seasonal wetlands. So sit back, relax, and join me on this science quest. Hi, Shannon. Hi, Steve. Shannon is the Natural Resources Extension Agent with UF IFAS in Polk County. Now, Shannon, exactly what is IFAS? What does that mean? So IFAS is the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, and it's a department under the University of Florida. Okay, and with, with the services that you offer, I mean, like, what is it that you guys do in Polk County? So what we do is we are the in-between for the researchers on campus and the general public. So we take all the information coming out of the university's research department and make it usable. Uh, and so oftentimes the science that comes in, the data that comes in along with it is very complicated. So I would imagine you probably run into a lot of people that need your help. Absolutely. We help so many people all year long and related to anything from commercial citrus to 4-H and youth development in my area's natural resources. Now you have us out here uh, in, in beautiful Colt Creek State Park here in Polk County um, and you're going to take us into the woods, right? Absolutely. So we're going to go on a short nature hike today and we're going to learn about the ecosystems around us. Awesome. Let's do it. Okay. Let's go. Better day to get out here and do this. I mean, beautiful weather. Nice and sunny and I'll tell you this, I mean, look at this, this is So, as we're walking through here, you know, there's so many interesting things. Like, I'm thinking, you know, for instance, this pine tree here. I know it's a pine tree because I can see the needles and everything, but... What kind of pine tree is it? I have no idea. So when you're trying to identify a pine tree, if it's a tall tree, it's usually easier to actually look at the ground and see the needles that it's already dropped. So what you need to do is you need to dig around a little bit and see how many individual needles are on each pine needle. So this one has three. Right. So when there's three, it means that the common name starts with an S, usually. And in this case, this is a slash pine. So slash pine is really cool because this is the kind of pine tree you'll see in a pine plantation. And it actually um, produces the timber that we use in our houses. Okay. And the southeast produces 70% of that for the country. Are there a lot of different types of pine trees here in central Florida? In central Florida, you'll get three main species. Um, but there are a couple of subspecies you'll find in south Florida. Cool. All right. Well, let's move on. So here's something pretty cool to look at, Steve. So right here we've got saw palmetto. Okay. It's a very common plant in central Florida, actually for most of Florida. And it happens to be right next to our state tree, which is the cabbage palm or sable palmetto. Well, what's, the, what's the difference between the two? They look pretty much the same to me. They look very similar. And when the cabbage palm is young, it'll actually be about the same height as most of the saw palmetto. But it's actually really easy to tell them apart. So the saw palmetto will have little teeth along the stem. Yeah, they hurt. It's called yeah. saw palmetto for a reason. <laughs> but um, you'll notice that the stem actually stops at the base of the leaf. Yeah and it then fans out. Yeah, it almost looks like one of those uh, Japanese fans that you, you know, pull apart and... Absolutely, but when we're talking about the cabbage palm, what you'll actually see happen is that the stem continues right up the palm frond and does a curve. Okay. So that curve is indicative of the cabbage palm and it's it unique almost, to that. It almost looks like a uh, palm leaf mohawk. It does, absolutely. Right down the middle. And you'll notice it doesn't have the teeth, so it won't hurt nearly as bad when you're walking through it. Now, when, when the uh, saw palms get, are small like that, but they get bigger, do they get as big as these trunks? Because I'm looking at these, and these uh, cabbage palms seem like the trunks are really huge. Absolutely. So cabbage palm and saw palmetto, all of the palm family, are closely related to grass, more so than trees. So they'll be the same diameter their whole life. Okay. So the saw palmetto 
tends to be a lot thinner. It can be up to eight inches, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, but the cabbage palm can be over a foot wide. Wow. So many cool things out here. This is great. Absolutely. Shannon, this tree is huge. I mean, like, how long do you think this tree has been here? Well, it's hard to really say, especially with a big hole like this, but an oak tree this size has probably been here for a couple hundred years. Now, what, what do you think would, like, cause something like this, uh, you know, to have a cavity in it like that? So there's a whole bunch of different things that could cause this, and since we weren't here a few hundred years ago, it's really <laughs> impossible to tell. But one thing that could cause it is if this area used to be more of a swamp, mm -hmm. what can happen is the water level could have been up here along with the soil, and this could have been a fungus that started right at the soil. And then it as, almost kind of looks like it could could have been something like that because of the way the tree is knotted here, you know, kind of bulges a little bit. Absolutely, and we have a name for that. It's called buttressing. So when the tree um, widens at the base like that, it's really indicative of swampy areas because it helps it hold its place in the soil. It's like a flying buttress on a, exactly. on a building. Exactly. Yeah. That's actually how it got its name. Oh, yeah. So this, um, this hole could have been a part that rotted out back then when the ground was up here. But another thing that could cause it is if you look really closely at the bark of this tree, we've got this diagonal line that kind of spirals up around the tree and the bark is different on each side. That can sometimes mean that we had a lightning strike in the past and that the tree has healed over it. Yeah. And that can also explain a hole at the bottom where the electricity escaped out to the root system. Now, do you think there's, um, do you think there's anything that could possibly be living up in here? You know, critters or anything? I am absolutely sure of it. So anytime you've got holes in trees like this, we've got all kinds of wildlife that could live in there. Anything from squirrels to birds, even honeybees would love a hole like this in a tree. I just see a lot of mosquitoes right now. There are. There are a lot of mosquitoes <laughs> and quite a few spiders in there right now. To see a huge tree like this and so old and of course all the damage that's been healed over the years, really neat. It is super cool. And if we look on the back of the tree, you can see it much more clear. So right here, you can see that the spiral and that diagonal damage actually comes right up and goes around the tree there. Yeah, and it kind of does like a twist almost. Exactly. It makes the whole tree look like it's twisted. And the cool thing about this particular tree is you can actually see that the bark looks completely different on one side of the seam yeah. than the other. And I don't have a great explanation for that. Trees do different things with their bark depending on the conditions that well, they grow in. Well, it's weird because if I, were to see, if I were to see this bark on a tree and then see a tree right beside it with that bark, I would assume they were two totally different trees. And that's generally a good assumption. But when we're talking about trees that are this old, mm -hmm. the bark will change shape over time. So, for instance, with this tree... Kind of like people, right? Exactly. <laughs> change shape. <laughs> Absolutely. And with this tree, the, the smaller, chunkier bark might just mean that it's younger, and the longer, shaggier bark tends to mean that it's just an older section of the tree. Mm. Interesting. Very cool. Super cool stuff. It's good stuff. <laughs> Steve, right here we've got a pretty awesome old oak tree, and it's probably at least 100 or 200 years old. But what's really interesting here is it's a great example of a tree and its growth characteristics when it's growing through shrubs. Okay. So you can tell that it had to grow through some shrubs because it's pretty straight up until that point, and then the crown spreads out. And when you've got newer, younger trees, like the hickory behind it, Right. What'll happen is you'll have much younger trees, about the same height, but they don't spread until they get out of the shade that the older trees are pre oh, creating. So is that, I guess that's then why the branches kind of just do whatever they want up there on this big tree because 
it was out in the sun and could go wherever it wanted to. Exactly, and that's why in your yard, if you plant a young tree, especially an oak tree, it'll start spreading much closer to the ground. We call that open grown. Okay. And that just means that it's not competing for sunlight, so it's just gonna spread out and do whatever and it wants. Make a beautiful shade tree. Exactly. <laughs> Very cool. Now, I also see like some other like little things Obviously, you know, you have some moss here on mm -hmm. on this side of the tree. And then there's like these like little, I don't know. I don't know what that is. <laughs> so right here, you've got this little crinkly dead looking thing. Yeah. And it's actually rare that you'll see it this close to the ground, but that's resurrection fern. And it's a really cool fern species that we have in Florida. And if you look higher up on the tree, you'll see lots of these little crinkly, dead-looking oh, ferns. Yeah. They almost kind of look like mushrooms sticking out, you know, from a distance. They do. Yeah. And you'll notice they're almost always on the top of the branches. Mm -hmm. And that's because when it rains, resurrection fern, over the next 8 to 12 hours, will come back to life. Oh, and so it'll turn green. Exactly. So it'll become bushy and pretty huh. and look just like a fern again. But in dry times it looks crinkly and dead so but it's even really though, not. Yeah, so even though it looks dead, it's still very much alive. Absolutely. And it's oh. it's pretty rare and you really only see it on older trees or on their root systems occasionally. So another cool part about this tree is like we saw earlier with that big knot in the hole in the middle right. of that oak tree. Down here you've got the same thing closer to the soil and this might be mm. exactly what happened to that other oak tree when the soil was higher. That's very cool. So just by seeing some of the some of the vegetation around, you can kind of almost get a picture of what this might have looked like, you know, several hundred years ago. Exactly. Very cool. Great. All right, well, let's move on. <laughs> this is what we're here for, right? The uh, the wetlands. We are here in the seasonal wetland or swamp, as people like to call them. Mm. So, what is it that makes? I mean, I'm seeing a lot of different things going on here. Let's start with the trees. They're different than what we were just looking at. Right. So you'll see some different species when you've got a lot more water. And one of the ones we're standing next to is um, the cypress. So you've got the cypress knees right here, and they're all over these seasonal Wait, wetlands. Wait, so, so these are part, is this the tree, or is it like part of the bigger trees? They're not. So they come up from the roots, and there's a few different theories on what their actual function is. We don't have a solid scientific answer for what they're for. One of the theories is that they help bring oxygen to the root system when it's highly flooded. Okay. So this is a really easy way to know there's a cypress tree around. Yes. There's going to be giant roots sticking up into the air. Right. So <laughs> cypress don't have to grow in a very wet area, but they do like some water. And you won't find them, say, on top of a sand mm -hmm. hill usually. But there's a few different ways that you know you're in a wetland or a swamp. And they're delineated three different ways. And that's by the hydric soils, which are... Um, these dark organic oh, soils yeah. here and this is all decaying organic matter and it's really slimy okay well so it really does the thing that's surprising is it doesn't really stink because you know you'd think with all this rotting leaves and things like that it would it would stink pretty bad but it really just kind of smells like dirt absolutely so that smell that you're associating with swamps is generally speaking sulfur and swamps and seasonal wetlands have a large amount of sulfur usually. But if it's fluctuating between dry and wet, that's when you tend to smell it. I see. And so uh, here in central Florida, our wet season tends to be, you know, throughout the summer. But a wetland could be wet throughout the whole year. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So water in a swamp or a wetland can stay much longer than past the rainy season. And that hydro period can really change between a few weeks to a few months even. Some cases it'll go on for as long as a few years. Wow. So swamps may not dry out until say February or March when it's been dry for several months in a row, but they could stay wet all the way to the next rainy season. So how does that affect um, like the ecosystem when, it's, when we're in a drought? I mean, how does the, how does a swamp area that retains the water help the areas around it that are lacking water? 
So seasonal wetlands and regular wetlands and swamps, they buffer what we call our rainy and dry season. So when it starts to rain, they won't fill up immediately with water, but they will hold that water a lot longer, and that can help the ecosystem around it survive a drought better. Okay. And it will also help, help if we get fire through this area. We don't want the swamps to burn as frequently as the uplands do, and that water creates a little barrier. Okay, very good. Now. What kind of things live in the swamp? Obviously, bugs. I mean, I got <laughs> mosquitoes are flying around everywhere, but what kind of things would I expect to see crawling out of these things? So you will find so much wildlife near a seasonal wetland. These are breeding habitats for many of the amphibian species we have, like frogs and toads in the right. upland areas. We actually say anywhere between 500 to 1,000 feet from a wetland is prime habitat for those amphibians. So you'll see lots of frogs, lizards, probably see a lot of snakes because they eat the frogs and lizards, mm -hmm. but you'll also find other predators in here because they need the water to like drink. alligators? Like alligators. <laughs> if there's standing water, I like to say get, you can see one. I gotta say I'm a little, you know, knowing that this could be an alligator spot, I get a little skittish, you know, getting near the water, but I'm with you, so I'm comfortable. It's no. okay as long as people aren't <laughs> feeding them. Most wildlife that might scare people, we like to tell people that they look at you as a walking, talking, moving tree. So you are terrifying to most wildlife. The only reason that they might come up to you is if they're expecting food. Mm -hmm. And that's when we get problems with alligators, right. bears, and of course it's all like kinds of it's against the law to feed alligators, right? Yes. Yeah, I saw that on a cop show once and they <laughs> arrested everybody. Um, yes, please don't feed the wildlife. <laughs> now, I also saw uh, some of these white birds with the big long beaks mm -hmm. flying around. I mean, is this, a, is this a place that birds really like to come and kind of hang out? Yes. So birds will come in both to eat the frogs and lizards, like our wading birds, our herons, but the ones with the long beak, the ibis, they like to eat the grubs that are in the ground. And so when you've got a lot of water in the soil, it's prime habitat for insects and insect larvae. And, and like, I'm also thinking about the vegetation around here. I see like all these tall weeds and things like that growing kind of on the edges and even somewhat into the water. What are, what are those? I mean, are they special plants that grow in the swamp? For the most part, all the plant life you'll see in a swamp is good. A weed is just a plant growing where you don't want it to. Mm -hmm. So if you have too much of something, it becomes a weed. But in the swamp, as long as it's patchy and you have different types of plants, you're generally doing okay. The plants that you'll find in a wetland tend to like wetter conditions year round. Um, so they might only be found in these areas with the wet Very cool. soil. <laughs> well, what else, what else are some interesting facts about the, the seasonal wetlands here? So the reason that they're able to hold the water is because of the soil. So we just talked about how it doesn't necessarily smell, but if you notice, it's got a different texture yeah. than the sand in your backyard. Yeah, it's, it kind of sticks. It's, right. it's got a heavier feel to it. Right, and that's because of that decaying organic matter. It'll help change the profile of the soil. And for most wetlands, there's a layer of clay underneath that's impenetrable by water. Mm. So. It's kind of like the chicken or the egg, which one came first, the, the clay hard pan or the wetland soils. Um, but that layer is what keeps the water in the so wetland. So you've got, you've got the clay underneath that's almost like the cement of a, of a swimming pool, basically. It's holding all the water in. Absolutely. But then this, this soil kind of absorbs, absorbs the water and retains it, which keeps the sun from drying it up or whatever. Exactly. And all of the decaying plant life, it's really spongy. So it kind of, it'll fluff up and expand with the water, which is another reason why if we lose the water in, ha in the wetlands or we drain it for development, mm -hmm. say, um, the first thing will happen is the soil will actually subside, which means it'll, it'll compact and, and start to shrink. And then after that, once you've introduced oxygen to the system, yeah. it'll start that decay process much quicker. Hmm. But with seasonal wetlands, both sides of that are good. And like, I would think after holding that and, and smelling it, it smells like real rich dirt, like the stuff that you would buy at, at a, a you know, home improvement store or whatever to put in your garden. But I don't really see a lot of vegetation like right here in these really, is it too wet for vegetation? 
No, not necessarily. If you look closely, you can see little tiny plants starting to grow all along the cypress roots mm -hmm. and also leaves from above. Oh, yeah. like and the dirt's kind of turned up also. So a few weeks ago, perhaps, this water was actually up closer to over there. And that's why you're not seeing a lot of okay. plant growth right now. So in, at, in this kind of texture here where it's still a little bit wet and mushy, mm -hmm. in another week or so, this could have a lot of vegetation in this yes. area. Absolutely. And you can also tell by looking at the trees where the high water line is because they'll change color a little. What do you mean by the high water line? So for example, on this tree right here, do you see how it's kind of darker below here? Yeah. So what that means is over time, the water routinely comes up to about here. Okay. And if you look at all the trees in the background, they'll all have the same approximate water line. Yeah, that's and cool. it just shows how deep the water in this area can Well, you can, can even get. see like where it's really dark, which probably mm -hmm. was just the most recent water level, right? Possibly, it could the, also like mean... where the, the green, yes. you know, everything's starting to grow. Yes. And then you'll also notice there'll be different shades of color, and that's just the frequency of how much water is there. That's cool. So Shannon, this is, this is fantastic. Um, you know, to be able to come out here in the woods and see something like a seasonal wetland where it's actually wet, and of course, we've got birds flying around everywhere. Beautiful Colt Creek. This is terrific. Let's, um, let's head on back out and uh, okay. see what we find. Sounds good to me. I think one of the one of the things that people are really missing out on is the opportunity to come out here and see some of the great things that you know we looked at today. I completely agree. We've got so much variety in our natural resources here in Polk, and it's just a great opportunity to get outside and see what we have. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for taking me out and and show me the wetlands and the different types of trees and all the different things that you find out here in 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 a place like Colt Creek State Park. Thanks, Shannon. Well, thank you so much for having me. That's about all the time we have for today. Join us next time as we seek out yet another science quest.